The Venus flytrap, Dionea mesipula, is the most recognized carnivorous plant and a plant famous for being an action plant. The plant's common name refers to Venus, the Roman goddess of love. The genus name, Dionea, daughter of Dion, refers to the Greek goddess Aphrodite, while the species name, Musipula, is Latin for mousetrap. Despite the name, flies are not a major prey item. The natural Dionea diet is 33% ants, 30% spiders, 10% beetles, 10% grasshoppers, and fewer than 5% flying insects. Insects that crawl into the leaves are the primary prey. They are native to subtropical wetlands on the east coast of the United States, North and South Carolina in particular. It is not a tropical plant and can tolerate mild winters. In fact, Venus flytraps that do not go through a period of winter dormancy will eventually die. When an insect or spider crawling along the leaves contacts a trigger hair, the trap prepares to close. The trapping mechanism is tripped when prey contacts one of the three hair-like trichomes, or plant hairs, that are found on the upper surface of each of the lobes. The mechanism is so highly specialized that it can distinguish between living prey and non-prey stimuli, such as falling raindrops. Two trigger hairs must be touched in succession within 20 seconds of each other, or one hair touched twice in rapid succession, whereupon the lobes of the trap will snap shut in about one-tenth of a second. It is not understood fully how the trap closes. The Venus flytrap does not have a nervous system, nor any muscles nor tendons. It is hypothesized that the leaves move from some type of fluid pressure activated by an electrical current that runs through the plant. The redundant triggering in the trap mechanism serves as a safeguard against wasting energy by trapping objects with no nutritional value. And the plant will only begin digestion after five stimuli to ensure that it has caught a live bug. Dionea is a monophyletic genus closely related to the sundews, all of which belong to the same family. In 1760, the North Carolina colonial governor, Arthur Dobbs, penned the first written description of the plant. I quote, The great wonder of the vegetable kingdom is a very curious unknown species of sensitive. It is a dwarf plant. The leaves are like a narrow segment of a sphere consisting of two parts, like a cap of a spring purse, the concave part outwards, each of which falls back with indented edges, like an iron spring fox trap. Upon anything touching the leaves or falling between them, they instantly close like a spring trap and confine any insect or anything that falls between them. It bears a white flower. To this surprising plant, I have given the name of fly trap sensitive. This seems to be the earliest notice of the plant by Europeans. The Venus flytrap is a small plant, which is a rosette of four to seven leaves, which arise from a bulb-like subterranean stem. Here we see the origin just under the soil line. Longer leaves with robust traps are usually formed after flowering, which occurs early in the season. Fly traps that have more than seven leaves are colonies formed by rosettes that have divided beneath the grounds. This uh, shows very clearly two crowns forming, and this plant is one crown. 
The leaf blade is divided into two regions, a flat, heart-shaped, photosynthesis-capped, capable petiole, or stalk that joins the leaf to the stem. These are petioles here, some longer than others. This is actually not the leaf itself. The leaf is the pair of terminal lobes here, and here is one open. They're hinged at the midrib and forming a trap. The edges of the lobes are fringed by stiff, hair-like protrusions or cilia, which we see here. They mesh together and prevent large prey from escaping. These protrusions and the trigger hairs, also known as sensitive hairs, are likely homologous with the tentacles found in this plant's close relatives, the sundews. Genetic studies have concluded that the snap trap evolved from a flypaper trap similar to sundews. Given that Dionea evolved from an ancestral form of Drosera, or sundew, the reason for this evolutionary branching becomes clear. Drosera, or sundews, consume smaller aerial insects, whereas Dionea, the Venus flytraps, consume larger terrestrial bugs. Dionea are able to extract more nutrients from these larger bugs. This gives Dionea an evolutionary advantage over their ancestral sticky trap form. In other words, they don't have to eat as often as a sundew. The holes in the meshwork allow small prey to escape, presumably because the benefit that would be obtained from them would be less than the cost of digesting them. If the prey is too small and escapes, the trap will usually reopen within 12 hours. If the prey moves around in the trap, it tightens and digestion begins more quickly. If the prey is unable to escape, it will continue to stimulate the inner surface of the lobes and this causes a further growth response that forces the edges of the lobes together, eventually sealing the trap hermetically and forming a stomach where the digestion occurs. These leaves have formed stomachs, whereas these leaves have passed their time. These leaves are open and are inviting prey. The Venus flytrap exhibits variations in petiole shape and length, and whether the leaf lies flat on the ground or extends up at an angle of about 40 to 60 degrees. The four major forms are typica, the most common, with broad decumbent petioles that lie on the ground and are relatively easy for crawling insects to crawl onto and be trapped. Erecta has leaves at a 45 degree angle. Linearis has narrow petioles with leaves at a 45 degree angle. And Filiformis has extremely narrow or linear petioles. This seems to be a variety Linearis. Except for Filiformis, all these can be stages in leaf production of any plant depending on season. Leaves lying on the ground in summer versus short versus semi-erect in spring. Length of photoperiod, long petioles in spring versus short in summer. Intensity of light, wide petioles, which can absorb a lot of light in low light intensity, versus narrow petioles in brighter light. Venus flytraps are by far the most commonly recognized and cultivated carnivorous plant, and they are frequently sold as houseplants. Various cultivars, or cultivated varieties, have come onto the market through tissue culture of select genetic mutations. Even single genetic mutations can be cloned this way. Plants can be raised in large quantities and sold at a low price. Plants can also be propagated by seed, but they take around four or five years to reach maturity. Individual gardeners can easily divide their plants once they become established, as this established plant has 
already the makings of two crowns that might soon be divided. Most Venus flytraps found for sale in nurseries and garden centers have been produced via tissue culture, as this is the most cost-effective way to propagate them on a large scale. Sadly, many of these plants are not well established, and even more sad, individuals who purchase these plants often don't understand that they undergo a period of winter dormancy, and the result is they get thrown out. Regardless of the propagation method used, the plants can live for between 20 and 30 years if kept under the right conditions. This afternoon I'd like to say a few things about carnivorous plants in fiction. Edmund Spencer, writing for the New York World on 26 April 1874, published a letter by a German explorer named Karl Lecce. This explorer, via Edmund Spencer, provided a report encountering a sacrifice performed by the Makoto tribe of Madagascar. This story was picked up by many other newspapers. The account of the plant sacrifice was graphic and quite creative. The slender, delicate palpi, with the fury of starved serpents, quivered a moment over her head. Then, as if instinct with the demoniac intelligence fastened upon her, in sudden coils round and round her neck and arms, then while her awful screams and yet more awful laughter rose wildly to be instantly strangled down again into a gurgling moan, the tendrils, one after another, like great green serpents with brutal energy and infernal rapidity, rose, retracted themselves, and wrapped her about fold after fold, ever tightening with cruel swiftness and savage tenacity of anacondas fastening upon their prey. The hoax was given further publicity by the book Madagascar, Land of the Man-Eating Tree by Chase Osborne, who had been governor of Michigan. Osborne claimed that both the tribes and the missionaries on Madagascar knew about the tree. Of course, there is no such tribe and no such tree. And the so-called German explorer, his annals remain to be discovered. There is another plant called the Yet Yateveo. In J. W. Boole's Sea and Land, 1887, the Yateveo plant is described as being native to Africa and to Central America. So named for producing a hissing sound similar to the phrase Yateveo, literally I see you, and having poisonous spines that resemble many huge serpents in an angry discussion occasionally darting from side to side as if striking at an imaginary foe, which sees and pierce any creature coming within reach. There is an illustration that outlines the power of this plant, but like the preceding plant, its origin should be found in fiction. Along with the next plant, the vampire vine. William Thomas Stead, editor of the publication Review of Reviews, published a brief article in October 1891 that discussed a story he said he found in Lucifer magazine, describing a plant in Nicaragua called by the natives the Devil's Snare. The plant had the capability to drain the blood of any living thing which comes within its death-dealing touch. According to the article, Mr. Dunstan, a naturalist who has recently returned from Central America, where he spent nearly two years in the study of the flora and fauna of the country, relates the finding of a singular growth in one of the swamps which surround the Great Lakes of Nicaragua. He was engaged in hunting for botanical and entomological specimens when he heard his dog cry out as if in agony from a distance. 
Running to the spot whence the animal's cries came, Mr. Dunstan found him enveloped in a perfect network of what seemed to be a fine rope-like tissue of roots and fibers. The native servants who accompanied Mr. Dunstan manifested the greatest horror of the vine, which they call the Devil's Snare, and were full of stories of its death-dealing powers. He was able to discover very little about the nature of the plant, owing to the difficulty of handling it, for its grasp can only be torn away with the loss of skin and even of flesh. But, as near as Mr. Dunstan could ascertain, its power of suction is contained in a number of infinitesimal mouths, or little suckers, which, ordinarily closed, open for the reception of food. If the substance is animal, the blood is drawn off and the carcass or refuse then dropped. An investigation of Stead's review determined no such article was published in the October issue, or any other issue, of Lucifer. It is likely that the article in the Review of Reviews was a fabrication by the editor. It's with these literary efforts in mind that we can consider carnivorous plants in popular films. The Day of the Triffids is a 1951 post-apocalyptic novel by the English science fiction author John Wyndham. After most people in the world are blinded by an apparent meteor shower, an aggressive species of plant starts killing people. The book established him as an important writer and remains his best-known novel. The story was made into a 1962 feature film of the same name. The book's protagonist is Bill Mason, a biologist who has made his living working with triffids, tall, venomous, carnivorous plants capable of locomotion. Due to his background, Mason suspects that they were bioengineered bio in the USSR and accidentally released into the wild. Because of the excellent industrial quality of an oil produced by and obtained from the triffids, the result is worldwide cultivation of triffids. It leads to terrible consequences. Now today, such a movie would play into the fear of bioengineered organisms. However, we have to think of the date, 1951, when the Day of the Triffids was written, and consider how present the author was. Invasion of the Body Snatchers is a 1956 American science fiction horror film. The screenplay was adapted from Jack Finney's 1954 science fiction novel, The Body Snatchers. The 1955 science fiction novel was originally serialized in Collier's Magazine in 1954, which describes real-life Mill Valley, California. The town was invaded by seeds that drifted to Earth from space. The seeds grow plant-like pods that produce vegetative replicas of sleeping people. They are perfect physical duplicates with the same knowledge, memories, and even scars, but are incapable of human emotion or feeling. The sleeping human originals disappear after they are successfully duplicated. The duplicates, according to the book, live only five years and cannot sexually reproduce. Consequently, if unstopped, they will turn the Earth into a dead planet and move on to the next world. One of the duplicate invaders claims this is what humans do, use up resources, wipe out indigenous populations, and destroy ecosystems in the name of survival. The aliens voluntarily vacate after they decide they cannot tolerate the type of resistance they see in the main characters. The film storyline is a little bit different. An extraterrestrial invasion begins in the fictional California town of Santa Mira. Alien plant spores have fallen from space and grown into large seed pods, each one capable of reproducing a duplicate replacement copy of each human. A local doctor uncovers this quiet invasion and attempts to stop it. 
The film was largely ignored by critics on its initial run, but has been ranked by critics as one of the best films of 1956. Most people know the remake of 1978. The plot has been changed a little bit. It is now set in San Francisco and the characters fit with more modern conceptions. Gelatinous space aliens abandon their dying world. They make their way to Earth where they fall on plant leaves, assimilating them and forming small pods with pretty plank flowers. Elizabeth Driscoll, a laboratory employee at the Sacramento Health Department, is one of several people who bring the flowers home. The next morning, Elizabeth's husband, Jeffrey Howell, is cold and distant, ignoring her as he empties a trash into the waiting truck. When she confides in her colleague, Health Inspector Dr. Matthew Bennell, he suggests that she talk with his friend, psychiatrist Dr. David Kibner. The 1978 film has been named among one of the greatest film remakes ever made among several publications, including Rolling Stone. The last film is probably the most familiar to people who cultivate carnivorous plants. The Little Shop of Horrors is a 1960 American comedy film written by Charles B. Griffith. The film is a farce about an inadequate florist assistant who cultivates a plant that feeds on human blood. The film's concept is thought to be based on a 1932 story called Green Thoughts by John Collier about a man-eating plant. However, Griffith may have been in influenced by the Arthur C. Clarke sci-fi short story from 1956 called The Reluctant Orchid. This was in turn inspired by the 1905 H.G. Wells story, The Flowering of the Strange Orchid. The film slowly gained a cult following through word of mouth when it was distributed as a B-movie in a double. The film's popularity increased with local television broadcasts, in addition to the presence of a young Jack Nicholson. It has appeared on Broadway many times and was the subject of many remakes, some more popular than others. The plot of the original movie. Penny-pinching Gravis Mushnick owns a florist shop, which is staffed by himself and his two employees, the sweet Audrey and the clumsy Seymour. The rundown shop gets little business, and Seymour is fired for his incompetence. In an effort to get his old job back, Seymour tells Mr. Mushnick about a special plant that he has grown from seeds he got from, quote, a Japanese gardener over on Central Avenue. Seymour admits that he named the plant Audrey Jr., a revelation that delights the real Audrey. It is suggested that Audrey Jr.'s uniqueness might attract people to see it. Mushnick gives Seymour one week to revive it. The usual kinds of plant food do not nourish the plant, but when Seymour accidentally pricks his finger, he discovers that the plant craves blood. The plant becomes something like a controlling villain and is a fan favorite, not least because it can speak, at least haltingly. Audrey Jr. looks like a Venus flytrap, at least when Audrey Jr. is young. In common with the other plants in fiction, most of these plants are action plants. They actively seek out their human prey, and they have a very sinister aspect to them. This is likely why carnivorous plants are such a popular uh, topic with young people and a popular house plant with many others. Thank you very much for your attention.